So today we're going to come out of Matthew chapter 4. I want to cover verses 1 through 11. I'm not going to have y'all standing that long. So I'm going to read verses 1 through 4, and we're going to see where the Holy Spirit leads us and how he will allow us to get there. Maybe we'll get all the way through, but we're going to do 1 through 4 right now so I can have you sit. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Hmm. Now we can sit. Special shout out to my hard bottom shoes people. Y'all endured that. Thank you. My high heeled family, y'all know who you are. I acknowledge you every Sunday. I see you and I appreciate you. And I'm praying that there is a blessing of a foot massage somewhere in your future. Family, today I, I wanted to cover this particular section because every time that I have read of how Jesus walked on this earth, and we start right around here is where his ministry truly begins to take fold because he's making his way forward. I'm always struck by this particular scene because it's the one time that we get this one-on-one -on -one engagement between Jesus and the enemy, face-to-face, one-on-one, mano-a-mano. It's the best pay-per-view boxing match you could ever get. This thing is 12 rounds of heavyweight battle, and Jesus comes out victorious. But I love this passage because every time I read it, I see something different. And today, I wanted to unpack something with the entire house uh, because I'm really sensing in the spirit that this is a particular issue that not only comes up on a regular basis, but it's one I want us all to be prepared for. And that gets to the title of uh, this message. If you're taking notes, the title for today is The Enemy's Strategy of Temptation. Let's go to work. <laughs> When I thought of the title, I said, wow, that's pretty cool. And then I looked at the acronym that it formed, and it said TEST, which is exactly what temptation is. That's exactly what the word tempt means. It means to test. A temptation is, when you look at the, the definition, it is a putting to proof. And there's many different connotations because there's a putting to proof in terms of a difficult situation or an adversity. There's also a putting to proof in terms of a revealing. But at the, at the base level of it, tempting involves testing. And the image God gave to me is, and I don't know if y'all are old enough to remember this, but there was a... Used to watch TV. I used to watch TV on Saturday mornings, and in the middle of my favorite cartoon, they would always do this thing called the emergency broadcast system. Y'all still remember that? It's different now. The, the version you get now is tame. It's a little eh, 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 eh. kind of dope beat if you really like play it and put some trap music to it. We'll talk about that later. But the version I had when I was younger was this really loud, annoying and you couldn't ignore, like no matter how far down you turned your TV and left the room, you could still hear that thing. But they called it the emergency broadcast system. I love the way they used to, to try to calm your nerves into it because they knew it was a very abrasive thing. So they would say, this is the emergency broadcast system. This is only a test. That's the frame of mind I want us all to have when, not if, when temptation comes, I want you to step back and remember this is only a test. The strategy that the enemy likes to employ when temptation is in play is to have us so freaked out by what is placed in front of us that we forget this is only 
a test. And not only is it only a test, it is not a, uh, a referendum on who we are and are going to be for the rest of our lives. It is a moment, it is passing, it is fleeting, but it is a test. And the best way to handle a test is to study. The best way to handle a test is to prepare. The best way to handle a test is to know the test is coming. I could never get through high school and college sitting there waiting, thinking there's never going to be a test. So I'm just not going to study. And then one day you walk into the room and guess what? They put that piece of paper in front of you and they expect answers. And the expectation is because you knew there was a curriculum, you knew there was a, a test coming that you took the time to prepare. I want the people of God to all understand that temptation is coming. For some of you, it may be upon you right now. So the first thing I want everybody to know is just like it said in that, in that uh, emergency broadcast system, this is only a test. The interesting thing about when that happens is, especially in school, when they would do drills and they would have the fire alarm go off, and the fire alarm, they would preempt it, would say, hey guys, just so you know, there's going to be a very loud noise. This is, our, this is us testing the system so that we know that it works, but remain calm, this is just a test. And so now the noise happens and there's a difference when you have that context. Because before you find out that the test is coming, if that noise just came on in school and it was a fire alarm, you assume there's a real fire and now you got to stop, drop, and roll. <laughs> and now you have people stop, drop, and roll, ain't no fire, no smoke, nothing's happening. Why? Because there was no context. They tell you beforehand, this is the noise, this is what's going to happen. And so when you see children and they hear a blaring fire alarm, which should scare you, they are calm. They sit and they patiently wait for this test to pass because they have an understanding beforehand that it is just a test. I want us all to look at temptation the same way, and I could not think of a better blueprint for how to deal with temptation than how Jesus handles it in the wilderness. I have five points. I am pretty sure I'm not going to get through all of them. Set that out there right now, just so you know. But we're going to get through as many of them as the Holy Spirit will allow. So when temptation came for Jesus, I wanted, I wanted to study how and why the enemy said the things that he said to Jesus. Because as I continue to, 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 to discover more and more about the enemy, is he is defeated, but oh, he's strategic. The way you are attacked is for a very specific reason. You are not attacked. You are not tempted by, by random things. When you are tempted, it is very specific to who you are, to sp specific to what's happening on the inside of us in a given moment. It's very specific to keeping us from somewhere we need to go or from someone we need to be with or keeping us with someone we need to be without. It is very, it's very specific. And so I looked at the first passage and I said, why did Satan come at Jesus the way he did? Let's go through these first few verses. The first thing we notice is that when Jesus enters in, uh, he, has all, he has been baptized. Now, in the previous chapter, in chapter 3, we see that Jesus has been baptized and he comes up, and I'm just going to read it very quickly because I love how this uh, it, it is laid out. Actually, I'll just go through it very quickly. Jesus comes up from the water as he's baptized, and it says that the Holy Spirit came as if, at, like a dove. And we heard the voice of the Father, and he says, oh, I love this. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. Then suddenly... A voice came from heaven. This is a voice everybody heard. A voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I love the declaration. 
I love this open show of affection between father and son. I love how it shows the power of what happens when a father declares identity and purpose over a son in this moment. He says, you are my son. I am well pleased in you and I love you. Case closed. That's the end. So what happens next? Jesus is in the wilderness. Jesus is hungry. So how does the tempter, the tester, the enemy approach Jesus? The first thing he says to him is... I'm going to scroll right to it. Wait for it. Wait for it. It says, if you are the son of God, wait a minute. If. We not six words deep and we already got beef. If. Me and my father already worked that out before I came into the wilderness because I was prepared for the test before the test showed up. God prepares us for temptation before it shows up. How? Because of all of the encounters that we are having and have had before the test arrives. Do not take your encounters with God for granted. There's no such things as small happenstance encounters with God. Every encounter you have is preparing you for what's coming. So when God said, I need to let my son know he is loved by me and whew, I am well pleased in him and that he is my son, that is preparing for him for the test to come. So when the tempter shows up and says, if, if, you have to see in that moment, Jesus is already prepared for that part. Because the first thing that the enemy does, this is point number one, when it comes to temptation, every temptation, all of them, please understand it, all of them, I don't care what you think you're dealing with, all of them start with an attack on your identity. Every single one is an attack on your identity at first. Because this is where the devil is trying to lay the wrong foundation down. And if we don't have the right foundation in place based on our encounters with God, based on the word that God has spoken to us, based on us reading and studying and having knowledge and applying his word in our lives, if we don't have that foundation in place, the enemy will show up with a test that tries to put down a different foundation. And the first thing the enemy says is, if you are the son of God, wait a minute, there's no if. I know that I am the son of God. You know that you are children of God. You know you're a daughter of the most high God. You know you are a son of the father. So everything that comes after if, null and void, because that's not a question. But if we are not nurturing our relationship with the father, if we are not constantly spending time with the Father, constantly writing down the things that he says to us in prayer, constantly staying in his word, not just reading his word and memorizing his word, but applying his word and then seeing how his word works in our lives and then taking that application and writing down the testimony and sharing the testimony. If we're not doing these things on a regular basis, now when the test, when the tempter comes, when the test shows up, the devil has a little bit of wiggle room to try to insert a brand new argument. And it says, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. And I was so intrigued by this relationship between stones and bread. I was like, why did the enemy choose these two specific things in this specific moment to try to test Jesus? Number one, we remember that Jesus has been fasting, so he's hungry. So the first thing the enemy does is scope out. I think there's a possibility for a misunderstanding of a need. He's been fasting for 40 days. He must be hungry. Let me tempt him to provide for himself. So when he looks at, so I look at the stones and I look at the bread and I'm like, why these two things as he chose to have them? Why test Jesus in this way? 
And what I've come to learn is, yes, one of the things we've heard is we look at this situation and it's the devil trying to get Jesus to do what he says. This is 100% true. But I think there's more. I think there's more specifically with why stones and bread. Earlier, I mentioned the first thing God did with Jesus was establish his relationship. You are my son, I am the father. That means we know right now that Jesus is walking with the power of God in him, but he has a father that he not only answers to, but a father that takes care of him. He has a father that's going to provide for him. So when the tempter, when the tester shows up and says, turn stones into bread, first off, I have to remember that I am a child of the most high God, which means I have a father who I know will provide for me. Why do I have to take a stone and turn it into bread when I am the son and he is my father and my father provides for me? My father will give me bread. I don't have to turn a stone into bread because my father will give me bread. Understanding that we do not have to do things that are not within our purview or jurisdiction just because we have the authority is paramount to staying in alignment with the father. So what Satan was trying to do was to get Jesus to become his own provider. He said, well, you've got the power of God in you. Do it. Do it for yourself. And what that does is that shifts and perverts the relationship between father and son. Because the whole purpose of the father is to provide for the son. But now once you start to provide for yourself and take God out of the equation, you have now decided that you are the provider over your life. I can't afford to be the provider over my whole life. I can maybe cover myself for about a year or two. But when we're talking about generational passing down, as Ty talked about earlier, I can't cover generational. That's up to the father. And so what Satan does, and it's so, it's so slick, he tries to get Jesus to take the role of the father from the father. He says, turn these stones into bread, provide for yourself. Because once you get into the habit of providing for yourself, once we get into the habit of thinking I have to take what's in front of me and turn it into something that God didn't intend for it to be, I now become my own God. And now my relationship with my father is cut off. This is the first encounter. This is the first test. And that was why I said it was important that we recognize our identity. We have to always remember that we are our father's children. And then I also thought about what it is stones are used for. Stones in the Bible have a lot of different uses. One of the uses stones are used for is to make altars. We, they, altars for sacrifice were built with stones. So could it be that if you find yourself in a situation where God has given you stones, instead of being so hungry to get out of the situation that is trying you, perhaps we need to look at the stones that God has given us and figure out, what do I need to sacrifice? I need to take the stones that have been placed in front of me and now I have to arrange them in a way where now I am willing to sacrifice whatever is necessary to strengthen the relationship with the father that I have. Because I know once I establish and keep the established relationship with the father, the bread will come. I don't need to manipulate stones and turn them into bread. I used the stones for what they were purposed for. Stones were also used, I love this, these were, stones were gathered and people would use stones to tell their testimony. So you would have these piles of stones and as you were walking down any given road, you would see a pile of stones and the stones basically said, God was here with me, God helped me. So on your journey, as you're making your way, you would walk by somebody's pile of stones and you would see their pile of stones and say, God helped them. I can keep moving forward because I know eventually God will help me too. 
And then when God helps me, I take those stones and I arrange them in a way where someone else who was walking behind me will see that God has helped me too. But if I take that which I am used to testify, to edify others, and only use it to feed myself, I have left nothing for those behind me to move forward and be edified by. God has given me something, and it has only been a blessing to me, and God does not give us anything to be a blessing only unto ourselves. Everything we have is to be passed on to that which is coming after us. So when God gives us stones, it's either to build something or to sacrifice something, but it's not to eat. And Jesus understood this. I love his, his, uh, his answer. But he answered, this is verse 4, and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He said, listen, I could feed myself right now, but that changes my relationship with the one who, has co- who will cover me in all things. I don't need the stones. I don't even need the bread. I'm hungry, but I need the word. And this is how testing works. Ultimately, when we are tested, we have to always recognize, number one, who we are. Number two, whose we are. Number three, what context are, am I engaged in? What context is this engagement happening in? And when we can do those things, when we are tested, when we are tempted, we can remain calm like Jesus did. One of the things I also love about how uh, this engagement, this particular battle takes place is that Jesus actually speaks to this exact relationship between son and father and stones and bread later on. So clearly he had knowledge of what was happening. If you look in Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 through 11, Jesus is speaking to the disciples. Now, he's, commis- he's told the disciples to go out. He's given them power to cast out demons, and they come back with this incredible report. And they say, oh, my God, even the demons tremble at your name. And he says, yeah, they're supposed to. But then he keeps going because he now speaks to the relationship of father and son. He says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. If you then, though you are evil, and he's speaking of the nature that is in all of us, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So if we go back to Matthew 4, Satan was trying to tempt Jesus to not ask the Father for that which he needed. And all Jesus says is no. He actually does not use the word no. He just says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The enemy tries to use temptation to undo the established relationship that we have with God. And so Jesus is already prepared for that. I wrote this down. I want to make sure I say it the way I have it written, and then I'm going to move forward. All temptation boils down to is trying to fulfill a need on our own while removing God from the equation. That is the nuts and bolts of every single temptation that you will have to deal with in your life. I'm going to say it again. All temptation boils down to is trying to fulfill a need on our own while removing God from the equation. Why is this dangerous? I can't answer for myself if I don't have all of the answers. I may have the answer for this situation. I may have the answer for this encounter, but God has the answer for all of my encounters. So when temptation shows up and tries to get me to do something that is outside of what I know God is telling me to do, instead of trying to answer it in my own strength and my own knowledge, I have to humble myself and go directly to the Father and say, Lord, what will you have me do? 
And it won't be the first time because prayerfully I have already been in prayer before the temptation showed up and said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Whether there's a test or not, I'm always asking the Lord, Father, what do you want me to do? Where do you need me to be? What do I need to be thinking? What is the word in my heart? What is the word in my mind? What is the word governing over my season? When I'm constantly asking God, what do you need me to do? And I consistently have questions for God in every step I take. There's so little room for temptation to come in and wreck my life. But this comes with us always feeding and recognizing the relationship between father and son, between the father and the child, us always remembering, I am a child of the most high God, which means there's nothing that's going to be put in front of me that God does not have an answer for. And I need to just be calm. This is just a test. I can wait. I can ask God and say, what is the answer? And I can wait. It will take him an hour. It might take him a minute. It might take him a week. It might take him a month. But I'm going to wait because the answer that God gives me is the only answer that's going to allow me to fulfill all he's called for me to do. It's worth waiting for. Some of us get real impatient when we get tested because we want the answer quick. And that is a trick of the enemy because the enemy wants to believe that he has control over time when he doesn't. And then once you, he, once you figure out that he does not have control over the time, the enemy will try to make us believe that we have control over the time. And then we have to take that and suppress that and defeat that as well because God is over all of it. So we have to remember in that given moment, we have to take the time. Whatever is happening in front of us, whatever we are being tempted by is temporary. Oh, I feel that. Mm. One of the biggest traps that the enemy loves to pull when he, te- when he tries to tempt us is getting us to believe that the thing that's in front of us that's tempting us will last forever. And it's not True, there's only one thing that lasts forever, and that's God. When it comes to being tested and we feel like there's a particular need or a particular desire, and it overcomes us, and it overwhelms us, and we can't figure out what to do, that's when we lose our sense of time. What the enemy desperately tries to do is make us feel as if the desire that has overcome us will never leave or the need that has been highlighted to us is one God will never meet. These are the two levels that the enemy is playing on when we enter into a situation where we're being tempted. Whatever that desire is, whatever the thing is that we want in a given moment, He tries to get us to believe that we will want it and want it forever. As if that feeling will not pass. Every single feeling passes. All of them pass. There's not a single feeling you're ever going to have that's going to stay with you for your whole life. It's going to pass. I know you want the purse. I know. Good Corinthian leather. The tag looks right. I know you want it, and I know you can touch it. You can feel it. It smells so good. You can see the Instagram post now. You ain't even posted it yet. I know. I know that ride looks fly. I know it. I know that ride looks tremendous with you in it. But that feeling will pass. There is not a desire under the earth that does not eventually pass, no matter how strong, no matter how distracting it is. All we have to remind ourselves of is it will pass. And if it's a need, that's the thing with being tempted. Sometimes it's a legitimate need. Jesus was legitimately hungry. He had not eaten food in 40 days. He was legit hungry. But that need, when it arises, we have to remember that our God shall supply all 
of our need according to his riches in glory. So if there is a need, I'm not supposed to be trying to fill it. If it is that apparent and it's gripping you like it just gripped her, (laughs) she felt that, I felt it with you. I know that feeling. But I have to remember that if it's really a need, God's already covered it. God has already put in place what is necessary for that need to be covered. And the way that Jesus answers Satan is so classic textbook Holy Ghost Jesus because he answers him with Scripture. The enemy engaged him with Scripture. But Jesus answers with Scripture. This is important because the thing I love about this, and I can't, I can't, I know now I'm definitely not going to make it through all 11 verses. But as you go through the entire encounter, as Jesus continues to, to uh, keep the devil at arm's length until eventually he tells him to leave, you know, he actually does not use my favorite word in the English language. He never used the word no. I was shocked. He never says no. He just replies to the attack with Scripture. Here is a great way to deal with testing and temptation. It's not just about saying no, because what is happening is when the enemy brings something to test you, he is trying to get you to agree with something. He's proposing an argument, and he is trying to get you to agree with it. Now, if I'm presented with an argument, and I don't already have an agreement in place, think of it this way. It's like sports. If a team comes to me and wants to sign me for their team and they put forth a proposal and the numbers look nice, I might think about it. I might entertain it unless I'm under contract, unless I already have an agreement in place and I have an understanding already with another party that I have entered into a contract with you and I'm going to honor that contract with you. So even though you're offering me one agreement, I'm already in agreement with something else. And so I just have to present the agreement that I'm already in to the agreement that you're bringing to me. I don't have to say no. I just have to present the agreement that I'm already in. I don't have to kick and fight and scream and rebuke. No, I'm already in agreement with something else. I already have a word that I'm in agreement with, that I was in agreement with before you showed up. And so now, when you come to me with a proposal saying, hey, why don't you turn these stones into bread? Whoa, hold on, son. Wait, whoa, 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 I don't agree. I can't even, I don't even need to say no. I already have a contract that says I'm in agreement with my father. So I don't have to say no. I don't have to debate with you. I don't have to do all this back and forth. I just show you the contract. I just show you how many times I've agreed with the Father before this moment showed up. Not only with this contract, but I can show you all the other contracts that I have agreed to and honored as well. You want to show me a different way to live? I'm going to show you my track history with God. And I'm going to continue to agree with what I have agreed with Because I know when I agree with the Lord and I agree with the word over my life, that word stands. I don't trust how Satan gets down because he lost. How are you going to come to me with a contract and you're the losing team? I got a ring on. My team has already won a championship. We got a track record. We got banners in the arena. You gonna show up? You lost every year talking about playing with us? No, I'm not playing with you. I don't have time. I'm too busy being excellent and in victory. I'm going to agree with who I have agreed with before this contract negotiation (laughs) took place. Every time Jesus was approached by the devil in this particular engagement, the first thing he did was to say, no, I don't agree with that. I agree with this. So that's why it's important as we continue to 
understand what this test is like, we got to be prepared beforehand. I read something, uh, and I I checked through a, a bunch of different sources. Apparently, when we make decisions... Our brains have already made the the decision up to 10 seconds earlier than we actually are aware of it. I said, wow. So the decision was already made. (laughs) Some of us are thinking about some of the decisions we made (laughs) when we were tested, when we were tempted, and we thought that happened in the moment. When in fact, that decision was already made. This is why it's important to study before the test. I've always, say, I've always said, if you, are, if you know there's an area in your life where you're being tempted, have a no ready in advance. Say no in advance. You know what it is. You know you want it. You know you shouldn't have it. You've engaged it before. It's not new. This isn't something you have not seen before. And if you haven't seen it before, you probably have seen it before. It just looks a little bit different. But it's the same thing. Have a no in advance. And let me put on top of that because of what what we just went over. Have a word in advance. (laughs) Have a word that aligns and is the foundation of your resistance. Because the word says, resist the devil and he will flee. But the foundation of the resistance was the word. When Jesus engaged Satan in that wilderness, it was the word that made Satan flee. If you're trying to engage temptation without a word and wondering why the devil hasn't fleed yet, it's because there is a word that we have over our resistance that we haven't fully agreed with. So now it becomes up to us to find what is the word that agrees with my resistance to the temptation that is coming. Because that's the answer to the test. It's the word before. What do I need so that when this shows up, I'm ready and I'm as prepared as Jesus was? I didn't even get to number two. That's a number one, talked about identity. And his identity was very much a part of that test. I need to know who I am. I need to have my relationship with God in place. And if I don't, this test is a sign that that's what I need to do next. And if I don't have a word, now I know I need to go back to Scripture or I need to go back to a teaching here in this house. I need to go into the YouTube archives and find something that this house has taught within the past two to three to four to seven to eight to ten to twelve years that covers that subject. Spoiler alert, it's there. Just so you know. That means it's my responsibility to prepare for the test before it shows up and not pretend as if the test will never come. So the enemy's strategy of temptation is hoping and praying that we don't prepare and that we get freaked out when the test shows up. Jesus never got, Jesus was not disturbed. He knew exactly what was going to happen in the encounter and he knew how he was going to leave. He knew he was going to leave and the enemy was going to flee and he was going to go on about his business. That is for somebody. Have a vision of where you are going as the test is taking place because it is your vision for where you are going that is going to propel you forward and through the test so that you don't have to waste time trying to figure it out. Because if we don't have a vision of where we're going, we will stay in the test thinking that was our destination. The wilderness was not Jesus' last destination. This was not the point of him coming to earth, was to have this encounter in the wilderness. He had so much more before him. There was so much more for him to do. 
So he dealt with temptation. He dealt with this testing because he had an understanding of his father. He had the word at the ready. He agreed with the word that God had given him. He agreed with what God had said to him about him. So when Satan showed up and tried to pervert the relationship and make him forget who he was and get him to do things that were not according to what God had Jesus on earth to do, Jesus had a word for all of it. And this is my hope and prayer for all of us. And it doesn't matter what the temptation is. uh, This will cover it. If you have a problem, I love this because I keep thinking of the stones and the bread, and I think about not only how he was tempted to take something that was one thing and turn it into another, I think about us. And sometimes that temptation is not about an object. It involves people. You want to turn that friend into friend wasn't meant to be that. You want to turn that business associate into and they weren't meant to be that. They were meant to be someone you build with, not someone you consume for your hunger. Too many examples I could possibly give, but I want to make sure it covers all of it, everything we just went over. And I promise you, I will come back and cover the rest of it. I will. I really, really will. Because but I had to lay this foundation down, relationship and identity. If you keep those things at the forefront, when you are met with temptation, you can overcome it. And it is these things to keep in mind that in the event we don't overcome it, because you thought that this was some cheat code to win every single time. Let me tell you, we don't always win. Every single encounter, we don't always win. We win in the end. We win in the end. But this is for the person who, has, who is in the midst of temptation right now, being tempted right now, not just talking about a person, but being tempted right now, whether it is a substance that you are trying to quit, you're trying to stop using it, you're trying to stop taking it, you're trying to stop drinking it, you're trying to leave it alone, you're trying to get it out of your life, and you tried and you fell, and you tried and you fell, and you tried and you fell. Every time you fell, please understand, none of those fallings took away from who you are. I don't care if you try 45 times to quit that thing, you are still a child of the Most High God. I don't care how many times you fell to that thing, your relationship with God has not changed. His love for you has not diminished. He still loves you just as he loved you when he put you in your mother's womb. That love never changes. The love for the father towards the child never changes. Whether you fall, whether you get up, you trip and fall again, he still says, I love you. Keep trying. I love you. I'm going to give you the strength to try. And then when you try again, I'm going to give you the strength to hear from me. But I love you through it all. We're going to break that lie in the name of Jesus. Because that is one of the biggest temptation traps, is we're tempted by something and we fall and we think because we fell, God doesn't love us anymore, God's not with us anymore, or my personal favorite, clearly I can't overcome this thing. All of those are lies. Every single one of them are lies. Let me tell you something, as long as you have breath in you, you got a shot. If you're breathing, you got a shot. And it's a good shot too. We have to not allow our encounters to have us believe, mm, I want to say this right, our encounters do not dictate God's love towards us. His love stays the same no matter what. Now, what our encounters do is, one, if we're prayerful, they may illuminate something that we need to change and make adjustments in. 
If we are prepared and understand that God loves us regardless, now this is an opportunity to come at this again in a different way. But what we cannot allow the enemy to do is say, hi, you fell, you'll never get up again. Because that is not in Scripture. The only thing that happened for every single person who fell, they ran out of breath. That's it. But as long as you're still breathing, you have a chance to overcome and beat that temptation. You have a chance to overcome and beat that addiction. You have a chance to overcome and snap that soul tie. You have a chance to be everything God has called you to be and have the relationship with him that he established with you from the very beginning. You always have that chance and God's love for you does not change. When we can remember that on a regular basis, that's when overcoming temptation becomes something that we do. It becomes a part of who we are. It doesn't become, it's already a part of who we are. We just start to walk in it. Yes. But it starts with being prepared for the test beforehand. It starts with the understanding of who we are, whose we are, and what word governs our existence. That stat I mentioned earlier about your mind being made up about 10 seconds before you realize it, what that tells me is if I fill my mind with the word, if I fill my spirit with the word and I'm constantly studying the word and I'm in community where I am around people who edify me with the word and I study their walk and how they overcome, now I'm giving my mind ammunition. I'm giving my spirit weapons. I'm giving myself a shot so that before I open my mouth, my mind has made the right God decision. Ten seconds before. I don't have to say no. I just have to remember what I've already agreed to. I'm going to stop right there because y'all going to try to have me in here till Tuesday. <laughs> Can't do that. Got to go home to the babies. Let's stand. <laughs> I want to appeal to a few people before I uh, give the blessing and, and we go on about our day. First people I, I want to speak to, and I kind of mentioned it as, as, as I was closing, God was really dealing with me about this idea of feeling disqualified. Wow. A lot of the time when we deal with temptation, it is the feeling of disqualification that defeats us before the test even starts. We feel like because we fell in one area, we might fall, we're going to fall in this area. So I couldn't give up alcohol. So now that means I can't say no to lust. I couldn't stop smoking whatever I was smoking, but that means now I can't give up alcohol. And so what starts to happen is we start to take one encounter and a second encounter and a third encounter, and we forget all the other areas of our lives where we actually did overcome. And we start to weave together a narrative where temptation has been besting us over and over and over when that's actually not the full story. So I want to speak to some people. If you felt like you have tried to put the pills away, you have tried to stop in terms of smoking whatever it is that you smoke. You have tried to stop drinking whatever it is you want to drink. You have tried to stop hanging out with the people you know you shouldn't be hanging out with. And you have tried to stop doing the things with those people that you shouldn't be hanging out with. You've tried it all. And sometimes it works. It might work for two weeks, it works for three weeks, works for four weeks, works for six weeks, and then you fall. And then it works for a year, it works for a year and a half, and then you fall. Please understand something. All of it is a part of your overcoming journey. As long as you keep your eye fixed on the vision, which is you overcoming that temptation, you passing that test and being everything God has called you to be, you're not disqualified. 
God really won't leave me alone about this. Uh, put a hand up if you have felt disqualified. If you in it right now, let, let's, let's not even play games. You in it right now. You're in it right now. If you go home right now, that thing is waiting for you in your crib. Put a hand up. Global family, I see you too. You can put a hand up in the chat. I got you. Keep your hand up. Tell you a very quick story because I'm a Bible nerd. We out. I think of Sodom and Gomorrah. And let me tell you, there was no more buck wild place on earth than Sodom and Gomorrah. They did everything. you thinking of overcoming. They been did it. And did it often. They did it so often it said the cry of their injustice reached God in heaven. People were complaining about that place that had never even been to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's how buck wild it was. And yet God had sent his angels. He had dispatched to have Sodom and Gomorrah completely destroyed. But he made a stop. He talked to his man Abraham. And Abraham said, listen, if, if I can get 45 people to act right, and I'm paraphrasing, Will you save him? He said, yeah. If I get 35 to act right, will you save him? He said, yeah. Eventually, he got God down to 10, which means as crazy and as far away from God as they were, as much as they were doing, even as Adam, as, as Abraham was interceding for them in that moment, God still said, if 10 out of you, just 10 out of you, I don't need you all to get right, right this very second. If I can get 10 people out of Sodom and Gomorrah, I've seen it, I've heard it, I know it. They're doing it right now while Abraham is telling me about it. And still, if I can just get 10, if I can just get a small piece of you right, I will save them. I will give them salvation just for a remnant. If your hand was up when I spoke earlier, I want to tell you there's a remnant on the inside of you. There's a remnant on the inside of you. I'm not saying you got to get your whole life right, right to this very second. I'm just saying there's a remnant. There's a small corner. There's a small piece of your life that if you will take that small piece of your life and give it to God and accept the salvation that comes with it, you can beat it. Let me speak that over you. Your hand was up. You have beat it. Just in putting your hand up, you have beat it. I know I had your hands up for a long time. Please put them up again because I need you to receive this. Global fam, I know you had the digital hand up so your shoulder don't hurt like them, but trust me, I see you too. Just receiving the knowledge that God's love for you is everlasting there is no fall in your life that is going to change God's love for you just get up and go again and go again with strategy go again with a plan and go again knowing that you can have a community that will edify you that will embrace you and that will understand exactly what you are going through. I really am over. I'm going to get y'all out, I promise. Heavenly Father, for those whose hands are up, I just pray that you speak into their hearts that the temptation that they are dealing with right now, Father, I pray that you bring a word into their lives right now, whether it is this word or another. Bring a word that aligns them with the call on their life that aligns them with the version of them that you envision when you put them in their mother's womb give them a word give them a vision and father let your love fall on them fresh and new right now may they receive the everlasting love of the father as the child of yours that they have always been in jesus name amen One more group of people I want to acknowledge before we go. Now, I talked about the man named Jesus who entered into the wilderness, squared off with the devil, and left with victory. 
If you want to learn more about how Jesus did what he did and the many other things that Jesus did, which allowed us all to experience salvation, me included, if you want to begin a life where you study Jesus, where you imitate Jesus, where you walk like Jesus, where every wilderness you walk into knows you're coming because you roll with Jesus, if that's the life you want to start today, go ahead and put your hand up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Salute, fam. Salute. Salute. Some people came home today. Salute. S salute. Some people embraced that victory today. Salute. I see you, global fam. Salute. Your first day walking with Jesus, fresh and new. Salute. New, new journey. Salute. Heavenly Father, for those who have received the call of salvation, please repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for making him who knew no, no sin to take on all of mine, all of my weaknesses, all of my shortcomings, all of my failures. He took them to the cross. He defeated them at the cross. He left them at the cross. And when he rose, as my hand is raised, I rose with him. And Father, thank you for the gift that is your everlasting love through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen. Mm. God bless you, family. Well, I just believe and know that that word ministered to you as they often always do. Remember to subscribe so that you can continue to experience this rich. We'll send you a reminder. If you want to sow into this ministry, we are reaching people, as you know, all around the world. And we need your help and your support to not just bless people spiritually, but practically in all the ways that we do. The giving instructions are on the screen. Sow into this and may the Lord bless you abundantly in every way. God bless you. We'll see you next week.